Hallelujah. Well, you guys see what we're dealing with today, right? Complaining. I know we don't have any complainers in here, do we? Uh, yeah, I know I can hear it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, we, we started talking about it at, at, at our men's life group Friday night down at, down at Billy's house. Yeah, it was about 11 of us there that floated in Friday night. Was, Friday night was just about like it is, like you're hearing it right out there now. And, uh, but we had a good, good group, had 11 guys there, and uh, it was a real intimate kind of a deal. Had two services going on, one inside and one outside. We had a service going on inside, and then we had the overflow on the outside, and they had their own little service going on out there. But uh, the group that was on the inside with me, I just started asking them about complaining. Because I knew what, what I'd be dealing with today, and I just, uh, you know, I wanted to find out if I was fairly normal in the complaining categories of life. Because, you know, I, I can fall into just complaining about almost everything. And it just seems like at times, it, it just seems natural to, to complain about almost anything. And the more you complain about it, it's seemingly the worse it gets. And then you begin to anticipate what bad is going to happen, and you start complaining in advance over things that haven't even happened yet. And so I found out from talking to the guys, and I won't rat anybody out or anything or say anything personal about any particular person's point of view or perspective, but all I can say is, you know, I found out I'm not, I'm not really in the professional class of complainers. <laughs> we, got, we have some professionals. Look at your neighbor and say, he might be talking about you. <laughs> yeah, say, I think he is talking about you. As a matter of fact, yeah, I've been sitting by you all service. I think he is talking about you. Well, you know, the book of Philippians, great book. I don't know. Have you guys enjoyed what we've done so far with the, with the book of Philippians? I, yeah, praise the Lord. I, I think the Lord does deserve a little praise on that. Hallelujah. Yeah, a little pitter-patter. Thank you for the enthusiastic applause. I'm grateful for that. But anyway, um, it's just, it, uh, this first time we've been through a book like this, just going verse by verse through, and, uh, and I think it's been really helpful for me uh, because I get to preach on a lot of things that I hadn't preached on in years and years and years and years. And that's good for me because the Lord... Uh, has taught me many things through 43 years of ministry, and and I've learned and grown a lot of things, and 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 I know our lives are filled with all kinds of different avenues and areas, it, it, not just all in one direction or another. And so when you go through a book, you get a chance to just just kind of get hit by almost everything. And I thank the Lord for that, and I thank the Spirit of God for leading in that. Um, when we get in the book of Revelation uh, in, in a few, maybe a, a month, two, something like that, maybe it might even be January before we get in it, because I don't think I'm going to be preaching Revelation at Christmas time, so, you know. And so anyway, we have about five or six, six or eight more messages in Philippians. A great book, tremendous book, the joy book, right? You guys remember that? Yeah, the joy book. Uh, it's a book about how to be happy in Jesus and why to be happy in Jesus and what did Jesus do that makes you happy and joyful in life. And there are just a lot of tremendously great things about dealing with people and dealing with uh, uh, circumstances that happen in life and things like my part, God's part, and changing me. I have a part and he has a part. And we've looked at those kind of things. And and today, we've kind of zoned in on a couple of verses that really deal with one of the, one of the major issues of our day, and that is uh, just pure old being a professional complainer, you know, a master murmurer in life. And we're being encouraged to be this nowadays. I know that this is not a surprise to any of you. The reason it's so hard not to, to complain is because we seem to be built with the propensity to complain. I mean, it just seems natural for human beings to fall off into the negative and start complaining sooner or later about a lot of things. And so we have this natural bent in life to, to complain about things and to see things in a, in a negative way. And then along comes a society like we're in today that is in every possible way encouraging us to be complainers, to find fault with things, to fall into a group that is 
uh, discriminated against or is taken advantage of or is overlooked or has been cheated by God or, you know, something. In other words, to fall into some special group of people that that complain about the same things in life, and we're all being encouraged to be victims of something. I don't know if you've noticed this or if you're aware, and I'm not trying to be a politician. All right, everybody look at anybody and say, Pastor's not a politician. I don't care. I don't care what you're talking about. It doesn't matter which side, no side, all sides. I'm just saying that if you pay attention to what's going on in our country today, everybody seems to be a victim of something. And we're encouraged night and day, whether you, you know, it doesn't have to be the news, man. It could be, it could be a, a sitcom, on the t- and, and, and it's promoting victim, victimization, you know. Like, to look at life like, okay, what, what, what our goal is is to find out what's wrong with everything. So there's something wrong with everything in life, and especially you. And, and, it, and our society seems to be encouraging you to uh, see yourself that way. And to become that. And the only way you'll become special is to become a part of a special group that that complains about the same things and tries to prove that somehow they've underprivileged in some way in life. And it's a ridiculous way to try to live. And the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, through the Spirit of God, in the book of Philippians, tells us that God intends for his people to be different. Now, this may be what our society is teaching us today, and our kids, by the way, our children that we prayed for as they go uh, to become uh, uh, negative and complain and, 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 and be, and, and the lack of gratitude just, I mean, gratitude is not even thought about anymore. To be thankful for something, to be, to be, to, to con- look at yourself and say, I'm blessed because God has given me this, or God has given me life, or God's given me a, a good brain in my head, and I'm, I have a heart beating, and I'm alive, and man, God has blessed me. You don't hear gratitude. Man, gratitude has been shipped to Siberia somewhere or something. And everybody wants more and more and more and more and complains more and more when they don't get it. So that's the society we're in. And to that kind of society, the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians says, Hey, guys, I don't want you to be that way. You're living in that kind of a world. You're being shaped toward that kind of way. I don't want you to be that way. I want you to be different. And and let me just show you the verses. Here's in the second chapter, verse 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing. (laughs) Hey, is that pretty straightforward? I mean, I don't think you can really misunderstand that, right? Do all things without disputing and complaining that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, that's us. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Now, I know that all the generations past have had their perversions and their, and their crookedness. But I'm just thinking that we are about among the most crooked and perverse that I've ever seen. I don't, I'm not really sure how we'll get worse than we are, however the devil will, will, will show us. Uh, but anyway, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. In other words, God says, when the world is dark, the darker it gets, the brighter you shine. And my intention for my people, the Holy Spirit is telling us in this verse, my intention for you is that the darker the world around you gets, the more you will shine as a light. In other words, you want to be a star? (laughs) What do stars do? Stars shine in the darkness, right? (laughs) So you want to be a star? God says, you can be a star. You can be one of my stars. You can shine as a light in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. You can stand out. You can stand out and be different. Now, I'm going to go ahead with verse 17 and 18 because they don't really fit, uh, 16, 17, 18, because they don't really fit in any other particular thing I have to say in the book of Philippians. And I don't want to have a whole message with two, three, mess, three verses that don't have anything to say about a particular topic. But here, let me, let me share this with you, though. These verses uh, uh, continue the thought of what he's saying, and it shares one other really important thing that I want to share with you. Look at him, verse 16, holding fast the word of life 
so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. In other words, if, you'll, if you as a church, if you'll hold on to the word of life, if you won't let go of the word of God and the teachings of God and the spirit of God, and if, you'll, if, if you'll be those lights in that world that's shining when everything around you is just blackening and closing in and trying to snuff you out, if you will indeed be that, one of these days when I stand before the Lord, I'm going to rejoice because this race that he's put me in, yeah. this race of the gospel, this race of the kingdom, this race that I've run and given my life for and now I'm sitting in prison waiting for my head to be cut off uh, over trumped up charges, it will not have been in vain. My whole life will have valid meaning if you'll just hang on to that. Will you hang, will you hang on to that is what the Apostle Paul is saying. And then he goes on to say, yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. I know that's kind of a complicated little sentence, and it, you know, but let, let me explain. I was trying to explain this to Wesley before church today, and um, I, said, I said to him, I did. I said, Wesley, come over here. Let me explain something to you. And, um, and well, you know, you got to kind of put it in when it comes along. And uh, I said, let me tell you what this verse means. So if I mess it up in the service, you'll, you'll know at least what it means. Because I want to try to explain this to you just very simply and quickly. Uh, here's what it has to do with. The Apostle Paul is looking at them and he's saying, look, I'm running a race. I've given my life. I've given my all. I want, I'm going to stand before the Lord one day. And if you'll just be what God wants you to be, be, then all of the work and all the effort that I put in won't have been in vain and my life will not have been in vain. And then he comes in verse 17 and he says, look, even if they kill me now, even if they kill me the next moment I breathe, what I'm going to become is I'm going to become a drink offering of your sacrifice when you offer it to the Lord. Now, I know that's really exciting, and I can see all of you just going, wow, man, now that really makes sense. But, um, but let me explain a drink offering quickly, all right, because it really doesn't have anything to do with the message. This is just land yap right here, all right? Uh, a drink offering, a drink offering is, is what it seems. It's, a, it's an offering that's poured out. It's a liquid most of the time, it's wine. One time in the scripture, it was something other than wine. It was called strong drink. I don't know what, whether it was rum, vodka, whatever it might have been. Whatever they were making, whatever they were making back then, it was, it was called strong drink. So it was stronger than wine, but it wasn't identified what, what type. But, but, but it was poured out. And here's how much was poured out, about a gallon. So don't think somebody's got, you know, like a little plastic bottle like this, and then they're going to they're gonna offer a drink offering to the Lord, and they're going to just pour out like a little cup or something, you know, on there and say, all right, praise the Lord, that's all. <laughs> but a drink offering was offered along with another offering. Yeah, yeah. The Jewish people had offerings that they had to offer for sin, like burn offerings where they would take the, the perfect animal and they would shed its blood and then they would take the blood and they'd offer it on the altar and it would, the smoke would ascend up into the nostrils of God and God would say, yes, I'm pleased with that offering and I'll, I'll cover your sin for another year. This was before Jesus, see? And that's what you had to do. You had to offer the blood of the innocent to cover the sins of the guilty. And so there were, you know, there were uh, goats and, and bulls and sheep and ram and, 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 and pigeons and doves. All of those were different types of offerings that were offered and sacrificed at certain seasons of the year for certain activities that had happened. Well, a drink offering always occurred along with one of these sacrifices. In other words, you don't just come up and offer a drink offering and that's it. it, it a drink offering is an offering that is, a, that is an additional offering given on, at the time of a burnt offering or something more substantial than a drink offering. And, and what Paul is saying is, look, he's saying, you guys are going to stand before the Lord one day. And you guys are going to offer your best to the Lord. You're going to offer the greatest to the Lord. You're going to, you're going to be a tremendous, you're going to make a tremendous offering. And all Paul is saying here is when you do that one day, if they kill me right now, you know what I'm going to be? I'm going to just be a drink offering added to your tremendous offering. And I'm rejoicing about the fact that I can be a part of the offering that you are going to be offering the Lord one day in the giving of your own lives. 
And Paul says, so I rejoice with you. And then in verse 18, for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. So the apostle Paul says, look, the only thing I want from you is I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I'm in prison. I can't go anywhere. They're probably going to kill me. Who knows? But I don't want you feeling sorry for me because I've run a race that God's put before me. And I want to be glad when I stand before the Lord one day because of you and people like you and the offerings. And you're going to be an offering to God. And I'm telling you, my life is just like a drink offering poured out after the tremendous offering that you give to the Lord. And I am so happy that I can be a part of that offering that you're going to offer the Lord one day. And I want you to be happy for me too because it's my blessing. What a perspective. The thing that makes it unbelievable is where he is when he's making this yeah. statement. I think I put in one of your, in one of your notes. <laughs> I got, I almost laughed at it. He, I, yeah, it's on the back. It's on the back. It's in the, uh, the number three, developing attitude of gravity, gratitude. He wasn't sitting in agape land slurping on a Maranatha milkshake when he said that. <laughs> he was in prison, man, about to be killed for his faith on trumped up charges. Boy, that'll give you a bad attitude. But anyway, this is the person, this is, this, is, this is the human vessel that God is using to pin these things to us about how to live life. I'm just wanting you to see that, man, he, he knows what he's talking about. I mean, you know, I'm just showing you that, man, he's not in some ivory tower somewhere looking down at the people going, uh, you know, do what I say and not what I do. No, I mean, here he is, buddy. He's the living example of everything he's talking about. So, so he's talking about not complaining and not murmuring and not living a life that is filled with ingratitude, but to be grateful for the things of God and to look at life from, 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 a, from a grateful perspective and a perspective of gratitude and quit whining about everything. Yes. Quit crying about everything. Yeah. Quit looking at yourself and feeling sorry for yourself about everything. It's what he's really saying. Because I'm going to tell you, people that live life like that really don't go anywhere. They just spend their life spinning their wheels just going around in circles. Now, I've identified four basic types of, of uh, complainers, all right? Let me just give them to you real quick, all right? And I don't want anybody pointing at anybody else at this time, all right? Don't be looking at them saying, uh, I, <clears throat> I think it's you. Don't be bumping anybody. All right, here's number one. The first type of complainer is the whiner. Um, believe it or not, the book of Psalms is filled, the book of Psalms is filled with, with, with whining. David did a lot of whining. I don't know if y'all know that or not. David was the one that said, oh, that I had wings like a dove that I might fly away and be at rest. Basically saying, I'm, this, this is too much for me. I wish I could just fly away and never have to be close to this again and never think about it again. But the only trouble is, David, you don't have any wings. And even if you did have some wings, wherever you go, you will be there. And if you are there, sin will be there. And Satan will be there. And sorrow will be there. So, David, even if you had some wings... You couldn't fly away where there was no, where there was no suffering. Yeah, yeah. David, and he, he, he gave scriptures and psalms about, about Israel. You know, Israel, when they got to the Red Sea, they whined and belly ached about, God, you bring us down here. Why'd you bring us down here, God, to kill us? Wasn't there enough graves back up there in Egypt? Yeah. And then, yeah, and then they got on the other side, and, they didn't, and, and God started feeding them manna, and they fed them for manna. Manna just means, what is it? If you see the word manna, man up, what is it? That's, it means, what is it? And that's what they, when they saw it, they said, what is it? It's just a little white, cottony looking something or another that has no flavor, no taste or anything, and, but it keeps you alive. And they ate it and ate it and ate it and ate it. I mean, they barbecued it, they boiled it, they cooked it, they fried it, they, you know, they did everything they could to it. Uh, yeah, right. Put it like tofu is what I'm thinking, you know, when I, I mean, I'm thinking something best about like that, you know. And, and, and anyway, and, and they got tired of it, and, and then they started whining. Israel started whining about this bread, and they said, we want some meat. God, give us some meat. It's in the book of Psalms. I'm telling you, Psalms filled with whining and complaining and belly aching about stuff. And, and they wanted meat, and God said, all right, I'm going to give you some meat. And he, he, he ran a bunch of quail up in there, 
And there was so much quail, and the people just got start stuffing themselves and stuffing themselves. And, and some of them died because they ate so much they couldn't even breathe anymore. And then, and then, and then some of them you know, didn't know how to prepare it and didn't know how to keep it. And so it spoiled, and they ate it and got food poisoning and died. And I mean, it was a horrible little mess. God said, all right, you had enough of that? And then they started complaining about not having any water. Man, we're dying of thirst out here, God. And then they got in their tents when they got close to the promised land and said, I don't know, we ought to go up in there. And they were really talking negatively about even going into the land where God promised us because the report came back. There were giants in the land. I mean, God didn't lie to us. There, there's a great land, but the one thing he didn't tell us is there, this land is occupied. As if somehow God was going to bring them into something that they weren't going to have to fight for. May I tell you, when God brings you in, you still got to fight for it. Yeah, yeah. There's an enemy out there that wants to take what God has offered from you and keep you from inheriting what God has for you. Yeah. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. And when I complain and gripe and when I whine, I'm a whiner, then I'm a complainer. And most of the time, whiners are or whining about the fact that life is not fair. Well, I've been trying to serve the Lord. I've been doing the best I can. I've been giving God everything. and What have I got? Nothing. That ain't fair. Life is just not fair. Well, may we all agree right now as one big giant committee right here today, life is not fair. Hello, life is not fair. You know where fair is? Heaven. When you get to heaven, it's going to be fair. Until you get to heaven, it's not going to be fair. That's one reason I believe in heaven and hell because I believe that God is just and I believe God is fair and I believe that, that unrighteousness has to be punished and righteousness has to be exalted. So I know it ain't happening here. As a matter of fact, what's happening here is just the opposite. Unrighteousness is being exalted and righteousness is being put down. So I'm saying more than ever, there's proof there's a heaven and hell because somewhere justice has to prevail. But the whiner, the whiner, 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 whiner. All right, all right. So we got some whiners up in here. I know. All right, second. All right, the second, the second type of, of complainer is the martyr. The favorite phrase of the martyr is, no one appreciates me. Nobody, nobody notices me. I'm just so overlooked. And, and, and I'm sure that the burden of millions of people traveling across the desert had to be really heavy on, on Moses, but... but Moses became a martyr. <laughs> Moses became a complainer. Let, let me just show you one example, all right? I'm just going to read these verses. We ain't got time to really fool with them. But I just want you to see how a martyr, what, what a martyr sounds like, all right? You're saying, well, I'm not a martyr. Well, you might be, but look at what they say. All right, here's, here's what a martyr says. Uh, Moses said to the Lord, why have, you, why have you dealt ill with your servant, and why have I not found favor in your sight? that you lay the burden of all this people on me. Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nurse and child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Now this is Moses talking to God. Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? This was, before the, this was when the quails were on their way. For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we might eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me now. Kill me at once. And if I found favor in your sight, that I might not see my life. Man, now that's a, that's a martyr right there. I mean, I've given everything for you and you've mistreated me. And why are you doing this to me? And I didn't do that. And, I mean, and so martyrs, martyr, I put in there in your notes, uh, <laughs> martyrs like the hypochondriac who had put on his tombstone, I told you I was sick. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, we, <laughs> so we have whiners and we have martyrs. All right, now here's the third. Uh-oh, wait, I passed it. I, that was it. The cynic. This is the one that I become most often right here, the cynic. The cynic is the person who looks at life and, and decides no matter what happens, nothing's ever going to change. That's a cynic. I'm just cynical about it. I don't believe it's going to change. I don't believe it's going to make any difference. Now, I'll tell you what else cynics do. Cynics get worse and worse and worse because what they do is they look at what happened and they think, man, the, 
the worst thing in the world that could have happened just happened. And, and it couldn't have been more perfectly wrong to start. And then you start thinking about everything bad that could happen on down the road, and you start imagining that happening, and you get an attitude about the thing, and when something bad does happen, you look at yourself and say, oh, I knew it was going to happen. I knew that was going to happen. I knew it. I mean, bless God, I knew it wasn't going to I knew that was going to happen because that's the worst possible thing that could have happened. I knew it was going to happen. Cynical. Cynical about things. See, these, and then these become attitudes of life. These become the way you live life. So you're not shining like a star anymore. Man, you're down in the pig pen with the rest of everybody. Now, here's the fourth kind, the perfectionist. The perfectionist basically lives by the motto of, is that the best you can do? <laughs> In other words, the, 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 the perfectionist is always uh, dissatisfied. No matter what you do, no matter how you do it, it's not right. It could have been better, could have been more, should have been better. And they're just dissatisfied. And, and this is an attitude. Now, I'm going to pop up a couple of scriptures out of the book of Proverbs, and these are classic scriptures out of Proverbs, and they talk about women. But guys, don't think that they're not also talking about you. All right? I mean, women are used here, but just, just I don't, this is a non-discriminatory discriminatory word, I guarantee you. Look at them. Uh, Proverbs 27, 15, a continual dripping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. <laughs> in other words, in other words, Solomon was saying that a, that a complaining woman is like a drip Drip, 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 drip on a rainy day, driving you crazy. <laughs> That's really what he's saying. I just put it in a little modern language. And guys, you're the same, all right? You complaining all the time. Living with you is like living with a drippy faucet. Drip, 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 drip. Uh, then Proverbs 21, 9. Better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than a house shared with a contentious woman. He's saying, Solomon's saying, you know, it's better to, it, it would be better to get to live up in the attic of a house as far away from everybody as possible than to have to live in a house with a woman that complains all the time. And me and you the same. All I'm saying is, nag, 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 right? Look at, look at your neighbor and say, I think he might be talking about you. I know he ain't talking about me, so he's got to be talking about you, right? Nag, 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 nag. Now, here, here, here's the whole crux of the thing, and then I'm going to move on to how we, what we're going to do about this, all right? All right, I mean, do, I know you recognize yourself in that. I know you see yourself in some of them. I, I, I fall into all of them at times, I'm telling you. I have to really be careful because I'm really a, I'm really a positive person. I'm really a half glasses, half full kind of guy. But I am going to tell you this. When I get in the flesh... When the Spirit of God is not controlling me and I've kind of fallen off into the flesh a little bit, I turn just the opposite of what I normally am. From being a very encouraging person to be the biggest griper you've ever seen in your life, I'll hurt your feelings in a heartbeat. I mean, I don't care. Thank goodness that doesn't happen very often, right? <laughs> Come on, give me an amen now. I mean, I'm, I'm out here hanging on a limb right now. Come on. Come on, right Come on with it. Come on. But, but so I, I'm, I'm, I'm confessing now that uh, confession is good for the soul, bad for the reputation, but good for the soul. I'm confessing, I'm confessing to you that I know how it feels because I do all of it, as you do. I know you do. And uh, if you say you don't, come on to the altar. We've got to pray that lying spirit out of you because you need to be on down here. You've got bigger problems than complaining is all I'm telling you. But, uh, but... In, 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 the, in the perfectionist of life and in these kind of things, nag, 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 that's where I was going. Um, does nagging work on people? I mean, really? I mean, the mo uh, the, does anybody ever nag you? If they ever nag you, does that really work? That they, you know, that what they're nagging you about, you just, just saying, oh my Lord, I got to do that. That's just the most awesome, wonderful thing. Let me just do it right now. No, no, it doesn't work. Most of the time, what it does is it makes you not want to do whatever they're nagging you about more than ever. And many times, you don't do it. So nagging doesn't work on you. It doesn't work on me. And my question is, then why do we keep using it? It's just one of those frailties of humanity, right? So the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians is saying, don't live life like this. 
This is not the way God intended for you to live life. So if you're going to be different, you're going to have to be different on purpose, and let me show you how to do it. Number one, there are five, here, here are five principles right here about living a life, not griping and complaining and becoming a victim about stuff, all right? Here it is. Number one, admit that griping, admit that complaining is a problem in you. <laughs> That's the kicker. No, no. Oh, hey, I know it's easy to admit that it's the problem in somebody else. I tell you, Wesley has a real problem with griping. I'm telling you. That. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is you have to admit that it's your problem. Yes, yes. It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer, Right? Because I tell you what, it, it's very hard to look at yourself realistically. And the reason why, and I put this in your notes so you would have them, so you could look at them from time to time and say, boy, that is right right there, and I need to be careful about it. There are two reasons why we don't see ourselves in the way we need to, and number one is because we hardly ever look at ourselves in the right way. We look at ourselves from our best intentions, right? Now, what we did may have been ridiculous, dumb, ignorant, uh, ungodly, wicked, and everything else, but that's not what our heart intended. We intended it to be good and sweet and nice. And so what we do is we have a tendency to look at ourselves from what we intended, not what we did. So you hardly ever see yourself the way you really are. I tell you what, we all walk around with these phones and stuff in our pocket. We ought to, you ought to just start taping yourself. Just kind of turn that thing on at the start of the day and just leave it in your pocket and just let it keep on running. And then at the end of the day, look at what you did, look at what you said, look at how you said it and everything else, and you'll get a picture of what you really look like. I guarantee you, it'll shock you. You'll be going, what, I, what in the world did I say that for? Or, my goodness, man, I don't know how in the world they... Anyway, you don't see yourself. That's, the, that's one reason why this is hard right here, because you don't see this yourself the way you really are. And number two, even if you do see yourself the way you really are, we are expert rationalizers. Man, we can make more excuses for ourselves than Carter has liver pills, right? That's the old saying. <laughs> Carter used to make liver pills. Oh, never mind, never mind. <laughs> Company. But anyway... Anyway, it's hard to see yourself for what you really are, and it's hard to look at yourself in the right way, and it's hard to, it's easy to make excuses for yourself. So take a personal look at yourself, quit looking at everybody else, quit deciding they need to change, and you change. It's all about you. Look at you, I mean, say to yourself, it's all about me. All right, this is all about you. Number two, accept responsibility for your own life. Many times complaining is just blaming other people for mistakes that we make. It's almost as if, hey, if I can get people to focus on somebody else, they'll quit focusing on me. And it's an effort, when I criticize and I complain, it's an effort to throw the attention off of me and throw it on somebody else. But I will remind you what the Bible says about this. In the book of Galatians, I don't have it on, uh, up here on the screen, but I'm going to quote it to you, and you probably, many of you already know this verse. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Here's what the Bible says. Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh... He shall of the flesh reap rotten flesh. If he sows to the Spirit, he shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. What does that verse say? That verse says, look, accept responsibility for your own life because you are the one that is causing what's happening to you to happen. Because there is a law in the universe called the law of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. You sow a butter bean, you reap a butter bean. You sow a corn, you get corn. You sow watermelon seed, you get watermelon seed. You say, nobody respects me. Well, are you sowing respect? Are you respectful? You know what I've found in all of my 60-something years of life? If I'll be respectful to people, they'll respect me. 
But I can't go along here expecting somebody to respect me and I'm just as dishonoring to them as I can possibly be. No, no, no. Life doesn't work that way. You say, man, nobody appreciates me. Well, do you appreciate others? When other people do stuff, do you, are, are you thankful? Do you appreciate them? Do you value them? Do you let them know? Or do you just expect people to appreciate you and you don't do any appreciating? No, it ain't happening. Man, I'm always broke all the time. Well, quit spending your money. <laughs> hey, I mean, if you're always broke, you, you got, you, your outcome is exceeding your income and your upkeep is going to become your downfall. Right? Can I say that again? I don't know if I could. All right, let me just see. All right, <laughs> y'all be quiet. Let me see if I can say it. All right, if, if, you're, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. There we go. There we go. You can, you can write that. I, I hadn't got that patented or anything uh, yet. But anyway, you see, you see what I'm talking about? Accept responsibility for your own life. Quit looking at somebody else and saying, they did this to me. No, they didn't. You did it. It's your problem. Change your life. You know how, you, do you know how to get other people to, to start treating you right? Start treating them right. That's right. Change the way you are. If you'll change the way you are, they'll change the way they relate to you, and life will change for you. That's very simple, Right? You look at people and you say, how in the world do people live like that? How do they, how do they you know, they're happy. They, they, they have nice kids. They, they, they have nice things. They're, uh, they go forward in life. They don't seem to have all these crazy things going on in my, like I have in my life. How do they live that way? They live like this. This is how you live. Make some choices. Change the way you live life. That's what the scripture's teaching us. That's what Paul is saying to us. Come on, man. I mean, you can't come to an altar uh, with a lifestyle, pray at the altar, God bless me, God give me wisdom, and then go out and live exactly the same way and, and not expect the same results. That's right, isn't it? That's right, Brian. Our definition of insanity is what? To, to continue to do the same thing and expect different results. Come on. Huh? If you do the same thing, you're going to get the same results. You want different results? Do something different. All right, here's number three. Develop an attitude of gratitude. Later on in the book of Philippians, the apostle Paul's going to say, it's in chapter 4, verse 11, he, and when we get there, you'll see it. He says, he's talking about his life. He, said, he says, I have learned, I, I have had nothing in life, and I've had plenty in life. So I've learned how to live with nothing, and I've learned how to live with plenty. And he said, I'm going to tell you the secret to happiness in life is no matter, which you, no matter what state you find yourself, therewith be content. Whether I got a bunch of stuff or a little bit of stuff, be content with what you have. Because I'm going to tell you something. You can always outlive your resources. You can make $5,000 an hour and spend $10,000 an hour. I mean, you can, there are a lot of tears shed in a mansion. An attitude of gratitude is, let me, let me just show you. Look, look at this verse. This is to the Thessalonians. This is Paul writing to them. Uh, chapter 5, verse 16. Look, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. But I want you to see verse 18. In some things, give thanks. In most things, give thanks. No, in what? In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And, and, how many of you want to live by the will of God? Just let me see your hand. You say, man, I want the will of God in my life. All right, okay, all right. So here it is. Here it is right here. Do you see what it says? It says, all right. Here's what you do to find the will of God. You be thankful and grateful and rejoice in everything because that's the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So you say, man, I want to live by the will of God. We'll start living by this verse right here. That's, that, that, that gets you going in the right direction. So in other words, uh, God knows us. And God knows that we will take the easy way out every time. 
He knows that we will never challenge ourselves. We will never put ourselves on the spot. We will never make life hard for ourselves. We will always follow the path of least resistance. We will always dodge the bullets of life. And so what does God do? God knows that it's the bullets of life and it's the hard places and it's the tough times and the tough issues that create the person that we need to be. And so because we're not ever going to choose to do that, he has to choose it for us. And sometimes we're in places that are tough and hard and unbearable and, and we're going, God, where are you and why did you put me here? And God's just pumping those things into your life to create strength in you and maturity in you and life in you so you won't be the biggest crybaby do-nothing on the face of this planet. So somebody can depend on you so that you can be an excellent person and actually show up to work. I mean, can you imagine that? Man, I want, they're paying me $25 an hour not to show up. I want to know, where'd you get that job? I want that too. Man, if somebody's paying you $25 an hour, they want somebody that's going to show up and work. And work. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. Let me move on to the next one. I think I've hammered y'all enough on that one. All right, number four. Look for God's hands in your circumstances. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 4. This is, I really bled over into this one. I just kind of got on a roll. Look at verse 17. For, oh, for our light affliction. <laughs> for our light affliction. Sometimes it doesn't seem light, does it? Sometimes it seems really heavy. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In other words, God's saying, there are a lot of things that happen in your life that you don't see, and those are the things that are important in life. As an example, uh, which is more important? This stand right here that... that, that my stuff is standing on or heaven when I die. All right, but you see this, but you don't see that. So the things which are not seen are the greater than the things that are seen because in eternity, this ain't going to make it through. <laughs> That's right. This won't make it through, but my relationship with the Lord will. In other words, the stuff you go through is intended to bring maturity into your life, and that maturity is an eternal thing. In other words, it's going to carry you through life. It's going to go with you in life. It's going to propel you in life. It's going to open doors for you in life. It's going to matter in life. It's going to make a difference, and it's going into eternity with you. So Paul says, look, don't criticize and complain and gripe and bellyache and moan your way out of the kingdom of God by not appreciating the things that God puts in your life to create a better you. Because that's what we're all after, right? All right, let's go to number five then. Practice speaking positively. Now, this is, I know when, when certain people see this, because they were brought up in the faith movement, you know, we've had lots of movements in the kingdom of God. And one of them was the faith movement. And it was, you know, speak it and it'll be so. Name it and claim it. Gab it and grab it. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever phrase you want to, you know, whatever phrase you want to use for it. Basically, it's uh, if I want it, all I have to do is say it. And then God's got to give it to me, you know, as if God's a vending machine or something, you know. Well, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about speaking. I'm not talking about just saying uh, positive things ab ab about issues in life. I'm talking about, well, did I put a verse? I think I did. This is what I'm talking about. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. What, what that say, what's that saying? That saying is, stop talking about things that are degrading. Stop talking about things that are hurtful 
and harmful and, 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 are, and are not of good report and, and let the words come out of your mouth that help. The word edification there means to build people up. Let the words that you speak be words that build people up, not that tear people down and criticize them. So when I'm talking about speaking positively, I'm not talking about make a positive confession. I'm talking about start talking to people in a positive way. Instead of looking at them as some negative bum that can't do anything right, find something that they do right. You might have to look real hard and... It might take a while, but certainly everybody does something right sooner or later. You just watch them long enough to find something they do right and then be positive about it. You know, you don't have to overdo it. Say, man, I, shoot, boy, I love the way you just picked up that clothes and towel and put it in the tamper there. That's the most awesome thing I've ever seen, you know. Mm -hmm. Man, I believe, I believe God called you to do that, you know. And just speak positively, and, 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 and the result will be, all right, when you speak positively, here's what the result is. I'm going back to these first two verses, that you may become blameless. So the result of speaking positively, encouraging people, is that you become blameless. In other words, nobody's going to look at you and accuse you of things. If you're encouraging them, you're lifting them, you're strengthening them, you're moving them forward in life. You're not looking for a way to kill them and criticize them and complain and put them down, but you're looking for a way to lift them up and help them be a better person and see life in a better way. Then you become blameless and harmless, which means pure. And children of God, good night, man, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine, so you become bright and brilliant. And the darker the night, the brighter you shine. You say, man, you don't know my house. Well, shoot, that, then it'll be easy to shine at your house. Because if your house is that bad, just a little bit of light's going to look like a floodlight, man. I mean, it's just a little bit of light. You don't, just get a little bit. Just strike a match or something, you know. I mean, you'll be right out. Well, that's complaining. So the Lord says, here's the way you stop your complaining in life. And Apostle Paul says, you need to do it because this is the will of God for you. You know, it's God's will for me to treat you in an encouraging way, in an uplifting way. It's not God's purpose in life for me to come at you to come in here and me to beat you up and rip you apart and downgrade you and belittle you and tell you how sorry you are and everything else. It's to lift you up and to encourage you that you can be everything God wants you to be. And sometimes, you know, you have to save something. I mean, I've said some things in this message today that are negative or critical. So it's not that you never say anything negative or critical, but, but that your overall life is that you want to build people and edify people and move with people. And stop, look at your neighbor and say, stop all that griping. All right. <laughs>